And to discuss the topic, let's welcome Dr. Joseph Ochogo, his Director General Institute for Peace and Conflict Resolution. Glad to have you join us on Good Morning Nigeria. Yeah, good morning, Nigerian. We also have joining us in the studio Stephanie Nadi, Nigerian entrepreneur and CEO, 1% International Management Services. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. All right, and then joining this conversation from our Just Network Center, would like to welcome the Reverend Joseph Hayab, Country Director, Global Peace Foundation, Nigeria. Uh, the Reverend Hayab, we're glad to have you this morning. Good morning to Nigeria, and I appreciate that in this program we have both the DG of the Institute with us. All right, uh, so uh, uh, let's, let's begin the conversation this way. We're looking at the imperative for peace and sustainable development. And out of the ongoing 78th General Assembly of the United Nations, the Secretary General delivered a statement and in paraphrase says that humanity is walking its way to hell. Dr. Ochobu, does that encapsulate the crisis that we are facing in the search for peace around the world? Um, thank you so much. Um, it is great to be here and it's great to mark um, the International Peace Day for the year 2023. <coughs> it's, um, it's an annual event since the year um, 1981 when the United Nations General Assembly decided to um, mark this day, you know, specifically for peace. Uh, I, I think what the United Nations Secretary General has um, re-echoed forcefully is the fact that um, more than ever before this is a time there is need for global peace, there is need for um, national peace, there is need for local community peace, and then there is a need to for individual peace. And um, if you look at the trends and the dynamics of what is happening around the world, you know that um, he, he was very apt in the statement in terms of, if you look at um, the threats, both subtle threats and real threats, you know, in the global agenda, the competitions among the major superpowers you know, for new spheres of influence and all that, it tells you that we really have to be very, very careful so that we don't um, begin to go back to what happened um, during the Second World War. So I, I think that he's right on point. You know, and, um, nations, leaders of nation states, you know, must understand that um, first and foremost, we need, to, we need to backtrack, you know, and look at where we are coming from to note that this year's agenda, which is... Um, the peace actions, you know, a global call for the for the for global ambitions, our global ambitions for the sustainable development goals is very apt. Without peace, you really cannot achieve any of the seventeen SDGs, that is the sustainable mm -hmm. development goals. So peace is at the center of human development and human existence. Okay, thank you so much. Let's bring in Stephanie Nadi. Peace is needed today more than ever. The whole world is in a state of chaos, wars, devastation, climate change, and all that. So what do you think back home here in Nigeria are the major threats to peace? Um, I think today is uh, a special day. Um, the is action for peace for all. And the dialogue around the world today, it's about peace and all of that. So for us here in Nigeria, we believe in peace and as in, you know, our diversity is our strength. And no matter how you see it, we are uh, all over the world, when they hear of Nigerians, they hear that Nigerians are peace-loving people. And this is something that um, we, we have, uh, we believe in, is a belief system and uh, our cultural belief as well. So, uh, as we observe this day, I believe that the, the world is looking at and adhering to the rules of the, the day as the United Nations have uh, designated today, every 21st of September, 
as the year of peace. So uh, I'm sure that uh, today we'll breed a new air of peace. Yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> let's go over to our just uh, network center, the Reverend uh, John Joseph Hayab. Reverend uh, Hayab, I I I'd like to uh, also ask you the, the first question that pops to uh, Dr. Ochogo. Uh, paraphrasing the statement by the UN Secretary General, said that humanity is working its way actively to hell, which of course indicates that peace remains elusive. What is your take on this? Thank you very much. Uh, let me just take you back to the last conversation, or one of the conversations you had when you were reviewing the daily news. Uh, you talked about the bursary award that you enjoyed during your school days. You talked about the feeding and the good old days. Sadly today, most of our young people are not experiencing this. I think that's the same thing I want to proceed by saying that. The peace, the unity, the understanding. You even mentioned that one of your course mates or school mate was, or some of them were from the north. And you could learn from the, the facilities or the bursary award they were enjoying because there was understanding and peace. Today, in most of our schools, do we see each other as brothers? Do we see each other as co- or colleagues? Do we see each other as fellow citizens? So there is this confusion. And so when the Secretary General said what he said, truly speaking, we are beginning or we have lost to some extent our humanity. We have lost to some extent our love and friendship. And culturally as African, we grew up to belong to every family. We grew up to belong to the entire community. We grew up to belong to everybody in our village, everybody in our state. I grew up in the military barracks with my father because he fought in the war. I know that anybody from the north, when they see, they will say dengue. Dengue in Hausa simply means a kin, someone from your community, someone from your family. But sadly today, that's not what we are seeing. So if the general secretary is saying that humanity is walking her way to hell, because she's, she has lost her humanity, he is absolutely right. And we must wake up to do something now before it gets worse than where we are now. And that is why this day becomes important to us, to the, to the whole nation and to the entire world, that there is need for action, for peace, and looking at our ambition for the entire world goals of development. We can't just keep talking, talking, and there are no actions. What is killing all this is because we've talked too much about peace, but we don't act in accordance with what we say. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Reverend John. And let, let, let's come back here to the studio and go deeper into the conversation. Uh, Dr. Joseph, the world itself used to be, a, a, it was like a family the social media the television and everything brought it into a global village we are one and the reverend said growing up we call ourselves dengue and i also grew up in an environment like that growing up in meduguri born and brought up there though not from there but I, I that is where i am from the community controls everything that happens a father we we'll see another man's son misbehaving and beat the living daylight out of him. And when he goes home, he gets another spanking again. But now, just talking to somebody's child and he feels it is out of tone, it is war. That little thing can cause a lot of problem in that society. Why are we running after peace when peace is with us and all we need to do is put it back where it used to be? Okay, I think the point is that, um, one, we have to look at the philosophical strand that has informed why things have gone the way they've gone. One, the economics. What is the philosophical underpinning, you know, for the kind of, um, the kind of economy that will run globally? We're running what is called the neoliberal um, economic philosophy, you know, that underpins the development of the world and the development of all nation states. And what does that mean? It tells you that first and foremost, you have to liberalize nearly everything you know, that pertains to economy, you know, and then the government has no role in it, you know, and um, everything tends to go towards the direction of privatization. You know, so the, 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 the control 
you know, of the activities of humans become a little bit limited. And that is why you see um, criminal groups, you know, having uh, major say, major influencing, you know, within the global space. You are talking of transnational organized crime. They can clone passports, do a lot of things. So there is a competition with the states, that is with government. There are rogue non-state actors competing effectively, you know, with the state. I'm telling you, just like the United Nations is gathered here, too, there are other groups, you know, shadow groups, you know, who are gathered to setting their own agenda, whatever those agendas are, you know, and, and, and the weakening of the capacity of the state to, to do a lot of things to is creating uh, what I want to call um, a, a modernization contradiction in the sense that um, we are supposed to modernize, you know, get society much more better, you know, but what is happening is that you are finding the you are finding the opposite of it because the control, the, the, the capacity to control society, you know, is weak. Okay. So some of the socializing agents too have been penetrated by these elements, whether religious socialization, <coughs> whether educational socialization and agency and all that, you know, to pursue some kind of agenda, you know, that is um, at times a free for all. So the kind of community you talk about is where you have a community that have a collective sense of belonging you know, that groom individuals to, to begin to have ownership in that collective um, group aspiration. But here, there is what we call um, survival of the fetus. If you look at what is happening right now in the world, it's all about survival of the fetus at the individual level, at the group level, whether you're talking about tribes or religion and all that, at the international level, whether you're talking about nation states and all that. So there is this crass competition you know, among groups. So instead of building trust, there is mutual suspicion. Instead of building confidence, there is no confidence between groups. And once we don't have that, you know, our society weakens. And because our society is weakening, these other kind of groups that I talk about, it is a cultism, you know, right in our community, they have footholds in primary school and secondary school. So, so we, we need to take more positive actions, creative and innovative actions to begin to to take back our society and take back our system. Yes, we need to consciously, as individuals, collectively, you know, take back our society to what we, and we need to, we really need to be very deliberate about it. We really need to invest in it. As government, we need to seriously invest in the peace agenda. If we really don't invest in the peace agenda, obviously what we are doing is that the whole um, things around infrastructure, around the economy, will definitely suffer deficit. Because the agents that I talked about in terms of um, criminal groups, miscreants and all that, they are actually organized by people. Yes. If, for example, if you look at the FCT, the manholes that were being removed are organized. The question, yes. you now ask is, the question you now ask is that, do we have police security systems around? Yes. We do. But like I told you, the organized criminal groups, you know, have organized themselves in such a way that they effectively compete with the state. And the increasing weakening capacity of the state to control these things, make these things to prevail. So, but if we need to do it, it has to take a very strong investment in peace, you know, to ensure, you know, that these things are reversed. Yes. So, if, if we're talking about, um, for example, um, the renewed hope agenda, you know, of Mr. President, a very strong and conscious investment, you know, in the peace sector is imperative. What that does is that it safeguards, you know, all the other sectors, you know, of the country that we need to rule as a developed nation. Okay, uh, Ochogo, thank you very much. Before we get into uh, peace investment, uh, I would like us to f further interrogate some of the key points that you have raised, uh, namely the enablers for the lack of peace. And my colleague, uh, Jumai, also captured it, uh, the question she posed to you, say, why are we running after peace, which is the elusive nature of peace, whereas it is right here within us, or amongst us, or within uh, our reach. But you say that there are a number of enablers. You started off with the new liberal economics, uh, but then you also talked very critically about the escalation in the activities and audacity 
of non-state actors and the witness simultaneously of the state in dealing with this person. Stephanie, let's have your take on this. And to say, look, what factors have created this kind of environment in which non-state actors are luxurating and the state itself is in retreat? Oh, I think, <clears throat> I think it's uh, when people are getting away with whatever thing that they do. I agree with Doc on, on, on that uh, perspective. Um, when he illustrated with the, uh, the non-state actors get it on and vandalizing things that they know that when you're caught you get into trouble and when they get into trouble they they mass words to fight uh, the justice system and all of that so I, I I think also we have to go back to uh, our, our cultural heritage as Africans and all of that uh, like uh, our presenter have said Madam Juma uh, you mentioned uh, growing up and how we, uh, we have sense of community and how uh, we can just uh, get punished by any other parent that is not your direct immediate uh, family and all of that. And, and that uh, came from the heritage as an African and all of that. If uh, going forward, uh, the youth in particular, I mean now you're talking about the AI now, and we have the Gen Zs, we have the we have the generation, the millennials, and all of that. I mean, in my era, I, I'll tell you that uh, growing up, it, it's it's easier for us, and where you look at each other and we're friends and all of that. And there's no hate, and nobody's preaching it. I think the the most of the problem comes from how the internet have and and the technology have made the global. Uh, village now a community instead so the generation of uh, hate speech yeah. and all of that telling your friend is no longer your friend mm -hmm. and uh, the politicians did not even help in this uh, instance um, for personal gains they tend to have to create their own agenda and they sell it and people run with it and it's easier for somebody uh, that is in the social uh, space. Uh, let's say you have a million followers or more than that, and you have people that just adore what they see, you know. So they're wrong with it, and and that's what it is. For 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 the the question again, I think what would happen in this is, I think we need more um, training for the people in the authority, that's the the security agencies, and um, within themselves to tell themselves the truth as well. And they need all of the manpower they need. And they need all of the, the, like I said, training is very, very important. And for them to really carry out their duties as law enforcement. And when people, sorry, and when people start getting punishment for wrongdoing, I'm sure it will curb a lot of all of this crime going on. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Stephanie. Uh, but let's uh, return to uh, Reverend uh, Hayab in, in Jos. Reverend Hayab, I, I, again, I want to ask you the same question because I'm sure you had uh, Ochogu here in the studios uh, sketching, if you may, the matrix within which peace has now become so elusive for all of us around the world. One, the rise of uh, non-state actors and the empowerment that they have received and the challenge that they pose to the state which is now gradually incapacitated uh, a, a winning control over everyone. Uh, what's your take on this uh, especially with regard to the causative factors of, of, of this new uh, social reality that we are faced with? Yeah, thank you very much. I think uh, before we start looking or accusing the non-state actors, we need to look deep and inward. In the first place, governance is about people, service delivery or providing enabled environment for service to be delivered. But when governance moved out or moved away from people and became more of a display of power, a display of wealth and other things. Then the people became disconnected with governance. So the shadows 
Professor Joseph said, now took advantage of the absence of government and the absence of the service and present to people as, look, we're here for you, we care about you, we will defend you, we will protect you. But in reality, the shadows are not going to protect or defend anybody. They just took advantage of the absence of what people actually have been expecting from government and now start manipulating and doing all that they are doing. So it is not far-fetched, as we say, peace is within us and uh, uh, with us. If we start doing things right, if governance starts service delivery and start attending to people, listening to people, making people the priority, it is not going to be long for us to dislodge the shadows, to dislodge the non-state actors. But as long as people are completely disconnected from government or government have disconnected herself from people, yes, she claim and boast out there that she is for the people, but in service, in everything, people don't even know her existence. The life of the human being will never be a vacuum. There's this illustration Jesus gave in one of his teachings that is always uh, interests me. He said that, you see, when the devil is cast out of man, the devil normally goes away. But the devil will come back again. If he finds that the heart of that man that he has been cast out is empty, he will even enter. He will go and bring several more dangerous demons so that the situation of the man now will be worse than before. I think the devil was cast out of Nigerians and out of Africa and out of the world long ago. But when we had an empty space, the devil came back and realized that there's really nothing going on in the mines and in the community. So the devil just went back and brought several more powerful demons to torment us and make us enemies of ourselves start accusing and looking at each other and then now we use uh, technology as an excuse the fact of what is that before a child grew up to have technology he is he grew up in a family there is the father there's the mother there are siblings or other relatives there are neighbors so technology becomes secondary what did the child learn when he was growing up at home with his mother with his father with his sibling and in the community before he grew up enough to lay his hand on technology. So we have to understand this. There are many things wrong, and I'm happy that we are discussing and finding a way out. So we just have to be honest to ourselves. Let me just go back and say something. When we started, uh, Ambassador Stephanie said something that was fine, but you know, I just hold back. Where she said, we are peaceful. That's the language we say. But are we really peaceful? Is there practical things we do about peace? So sometimes we just say, oh, Nigerians are peaceful. Where is the peace? What do we see that shows that there is peace? So we like singing those slogans that makes us happy. We like singing, saying those things that make us feel all is well. But in reality, hundreds are being killed. Why am I in just? I'm in just because the Global Peace Foundation felt there's a need for us to add our voice and our effort in the intervention in Plateau State. So we came in on Monday and started a work in one community called Round Hole uh, Canaan here. So the issue simply is we must admit the reality of things that have gone wrong then we begin to find solutions. But when we begin to walk and, no, everything is all right, everything is well, everything is not well. People are disconnected with the reality of their time and they get angry when they now hear stories like the initial story you share with us of how things were before. And they ask questions, what do we do wrong that those things are not happening now? If you say that it's because of shadows, who are those shadows? And why is our government not showing her might? Because government is the only institution by law that has the power for certain things. But when she fell, then someone will do it for her. I'm going to say with you, Reverend John, you know, the fundamental message of any religion from Hinduism, Christianity, Islam, and Buddhism and all is the message of peace. That is what it, it teaches its followers, peace. And we are the most religious country in this world. But it seems, are we really walking the talk as we discuss peace? Okay, this is one of the most embarrassing aspects of this kind of conversation. When you look at the number of churches, when you look at the number of mosques, when you look at the crowd that go to mosques on Fridays and the crowd that attend churches on Sunday, you hear the loudspeakers with prayers and all those godly things we talk about, but we still live hating one another. We still live looking at each other as enemies. It is quite unfortunate. Uh, I was in uh, Portland, Oregon some years ago, and I picked this message out there where they say hate is not in our community. Hate is not in our culture. Hate is not in our religion. I, it was six years ago, actually, I went there uh, to do that activity. I shared it with my, those who are on my status just two days ago, and some people were making comments. I said, hate should not be in our religion. If truly our religion is a religion of peace, 
The global, the global community is asking us to act peace, to speak peace, to show peace, to do peace. Look at the programs we are holding all over the world saying we are talking about peace. People keep coming yearly and monthly to attend peace workshops. But after that, a little provocation. The same people who attended peace workshop last month will start carrying dagger against each other. Are they truly showing that they know what their religious teaches? They are even bringing shame to their religion. And I want to challenge faith leaders who may be watching or who are listening to me. Please, let's give our religion a good name by acting responsibly, by teaching what is right. But when you instigate people to fight their neighbor, to see another person as an enemy, you have not taught them anything religious. From science, we are human beings and we are members of one family. Look at it. There is no religious blood group in all blood groups that we talk about. If you go to the hospital and they are looking for a blood group, they won't say, oh, this blood group is a Muslim blood group, or oh, this one is a Christian blood group, or oh, this one is a Southern blood group. Blood group is about humanity. So humans are members of one family, under God as religious people, but are we really teaching it? Are we really practicing it? Are we really displaying and showing people the right thing to do? I want us to begin to engage people from the grassroots to every layers. Let them see that, look, we grew up in a culture that is rich, that teaches peace. What went wrong? Let's go back, as one of the speakers says, back to our culture and do what is right. But truly, at the moment, things are not going on well. Right. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Reverend, uh, for your intervention. Now, back to the studios. Uh, Dr. Chogu, uh, I, I want to come back again to these fundamental uh, issues that uh, we are still conversing in, in the course of, of, of this conversation. The the fabric of, of society is frayed. And it, you've provided your own explanation. The Reverend has also intervened, and Stephanie here has also uh, uh, intervened. Now, the Reverend was talking about the, the missing socialization element. And earlier, you were talking about neoliberal economics and then the individualism that it fosters and it chases after wealth and all kinds of things. Groups, that's to say gregariousness, for instance, it's, it's one of the traits of, of humanity and a number of animals around the world. And for that group to, to be sustained, you need peace, even though conflict is an aspect of life. But you need peace perpetually uh, and on a higher scale than conflict and the capacity to also resolve the conflict. So taking it from that foundation, and then reducing it to our own environment. What is it that we can begin to do about first the individual, the family, the larger society, and ultimately the country before the rest of the world? Yeah, I, I think it's important to mention that <clears throat> every individual human being, you know, seeks for peace, harmony, prosperity, and growth, and well-being even if the person is a criminal, even if the person is a bandit, even if the person is an unknown gunman, even, no matter the human, no matter the nature of man, every man, every has a, every human being, has a quest for peace, for progress, for prosperity, for growth, and his own individual well-being, and his own group well-being, and all that. And that is why even when those who are armed robbers or criminals or bandits or wherever they are, when they finish with their money, they still want to come back somewhere in the city to do or to enjoy life. So I, I think that largely what we need to do is first and foremost modernization, positive modernization. I've um, followed the, plat the crisis in the plateau for a very long period of time, over getting to two decades now. And one of my major findings is the fact that this society yearns for opening up. You can't box people. Society needs to open up in terms of um, one, infrastructure. Two, employment, livelihood. Once people are employed, they feel a sense of community, a sense of belonging, a sense of ownership, a sense of contribution. But once people can get engaged, either first and foremost, after primary school, they can get employed. After secondary school, there is no employment. After university, there is no employment. And you find all these cross-cutting levels of unemployed 
um, citizens. All you are begging for, you are begging for crisis because they must find an alternative. They must fall into the hands of these other actors that I talked about. Either in terms of trying to join cults to have a sense of belonging because there's no provision for employment and all that. So, so like I said, we need to be very deliberate and intentional to understand that we need to mainstream peace in whatever development agenda that we are doing. That is to say, if you are working in the health sector, if you are working in the mining sector, if you are working in the education sector, whatever sector that you are working at, know that peace is very central. Because on the average, every human being is a peace worker. From your home to your workplace, on the road, wherever you find yourself, you are doing peace work. So the, the onus now is on the, on the central agency. And the central agency largely is the government, which provides the regulatory framework you know, for how human beings live their life. Everywhere, even in the United States, that is the father of neoliberal, neoliberalism. They are one of the most heavily controlled states. Even the United Kingdom. Their citizens, to a very large extent, have control. So we cannot um, buy certain kind of philosophy you know, without the essentials, you know, of how we run those philosophies. And for Nigeria, for example, this philosophy started in 1986 with the structural adjustment program, you know, that was foisted on us by the World Bank and the IMF. Removal of subsidy, like he was talking about issues around scholarship, you know, um, subsidies in hospital. A lot of things, you know, actually went wrong with that philosophy that we really didn't bother about it. And we ran with it, hook, line, and sinker, perhaps in the wrong direction. So what we do now is uh, we do a bit of patchy stuff. So we need to first and foremost understand that government must have capacity to regulate the conduct of its citizens in certain ways. Of course, people say they have freedom of speech. Of course, you have freedom of speech. But the freedom of speech you have does not mean that you should insult me or insult the government. So we must know where our limitations are. And the capacity of the state to be able to do some of those things must be enhanced if we really need to to live in peace. So we are talking about, for example, the kind of crisis we have now. How do we engage in massive infrastructural development? Roads, our airport system, the modernization of our economy, the change in our educational system to make it purpose fit for the kind of society that we aspire to. If we don't do that, we really aren't going to help matters. If you go around right now, nearly all the public schools, primary schools, for example, are almost um, epileptic. I think the ones in FCT, they are on strike. I'm sure nobody knows that the primary schools in FCT are on strike. Yes, they've been on strike. If you go to any primary school in FCT now, they are closed. For how long? No, I know, and that is why I'm mentioning it on NTA, yeah, because they are, I know... They are on strike. No, they are on strike. Primary schools they are on strike. strike. So we, we cannot continue... To, 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 to pretend about some of these things. And that is the foundation. And that is the foundation. The and the primary school, you know, is with the local governments. And where is the local government? Non-existent. The local government are nearly non-existent. And that is where the people are. And that is why we are actually suffering what we are suffering. So the, the federal government, the state government, they have to be deliberate to empower local government to deliver some of these things. Else, a lot of these things we are saying are just going to be hanging. Mm. I've been in this um, sector for over 20 years. So I can confidently tell you, you know, that until the local government is empowered, the councillors, the education secretary, and all the people that work in the education sector, in the health sector, in the social welfare system, at the local government level, the 774 local governments that we have in Nigeria, are functioning. And looking at issues of water, issues of um, internal road system and all that, then we've not started anything. I can assure you that. PHCs, primary health care centers. Yes. If we don't make them very effective, we've not started anything yet. Uh, uh, no, well, matter, no matter how um, the goodwill of the federal government to do certain things, no matter how state governors want to do certain things, if they don't go back to the local government system, get the traditional rulers and all the systems within the local government system that give the people a direct sense of belonging you know, to do certain things, then we are still far away from the peace that we are talking about. And do peace we have we enough to peace structures in Nigeria to ensure that people are educated and enlightened about maintaining peace for economic growth? 
there's what is called infrastructure for peace. Okay. Those infrastructures for peace are there already. And where they are not, nothing stops us from creating some. There is no community you go now, you won't find a youth leader, you won't find traditional rulers, you won't find and all, and all that. Yes. You know, how do we begin to build cohesions among these various groups in their society for them to know that, well, this is their society? And build their relationship from community A to community B and increase that network of connectivity among various local communities and groups to provide understanding for them, for dialogue with them, so that if there is a misunderstanding, for example, between a farmer and a header in a local community, there is a conflict resolution mechanism that is traditional to them that you understand, and they can relate to it. Because if we don't do that, this is where the problem really is. The criminal element, you know, we take advantage of these differences and create more differences between these people. There will be misunderstanding, there will be crisis, the criminal elements will be thriving, the society will be suffering. All right, Otogu, thank you very much there for your analysis. Uh, Stephanie, I, I, I want to come back to you. We, we are in, in a situation where if we were merely to be saying, look, let's run after peace, as uh, Jumai said, we might miss the key essentials. What, in your opinion, are the requirements, first at the individual level, next level, family, and then groups, and of course, uh, society and, and government, uh, for us to look at what is happening around us and how to begin to ramp up the peace dividend? Okay, I think, <coughs> sorry, first, as a person, um, you should come across as someone that people, that is believable. I mean, when you preach uh, a peace, I can come on the television, good morning, Nigeria, and, and I'll tell you all the things, the good things that you want to hear, and, and uh, people that are um, like a role model, right? And people are looking up to me, the youths, yeah? And um, I step out of here, and they're looking at their role model, do something else. And that's first of all, kills it for them, the belief system. So I'll tell you this, uh, for peace to strive the way we want it to go, it has to be something that you believe, first of all, as an individual, and how you relate that to your immediate family. So I'll, I'll take you back personal. Uh, the other day, I, I took my daughter out, and um, I just decided to just do some charity work. And I, I, I told her I'm, do, I'm paying it forward. And I said, I, I want to show you how this is done. So I, I took out some, some, some gift item and all of that in the car. I didn't want any driver, and it was just us. And so I was driving, and I, I looked at this man in the traffic, and I felt uh, my instinct just said, this guy really needed what you want to give. So I want that, and I'm like, hello, good morning. I'm like, are you, are you making a U-turn now? And, and they're saying, you're like, yeah. And it was very sad. I said, okay, when you turn, I want, I want to see you. I need to see you. Okay. So when, when I did that, and I pulled over, and I went to him first. I said, I'm sorry, sir. I, I have something to give to you. And he was like, what? I said, I'm teaching my daughter how to pay it forward. So. If it's okay, I'll give you what I have. And he was looking at me. So I went back to the car and got the stuff and I gave him, I gave him some money. And he was so relieved and started saying, well, God bless you, God bless you. And she looked at me, I'm like, Mama, is that how it's done? I said, yeah, you pay it forward to the people that you do not know and the people that would not pay you back, you know. So that's how you start. Imagine me passing that on to her. So going forward, and she has seen me do things like that over and over again to people that you do not know. And the joy that it gives, knowing that just one minute this guy is sad, the next minute he's, he's, smiling. he's smiling, he was so happy. Except, and, how do you deal with this? That this is part of the social disharmony that we are experiencing. Good thing you did what you did. But there are some persons, out of the widespread suspicions we now have about each and one another, yes. they will say, if you accept this thing from this madam, she will be taking away your destiny. <laughs> okay, I've also, I've also suffered. I've, also, I've, I've suffered. Of you, you I've, across, I've, yeah. suffered, I've suffered that earlier when she was much younger. So I was bring, uh, bringing her back to, from school, and I saw this man that fell 
on the way side. You know how I was just driving around the Tiwa at Danjuma, and then all of a sudden, I just noticed somebody fell, and I parked and I went to him, and I was trying to. So all the motorists stopped as well, and they were trying to. And then he said um, he came to see someone, something about his drugs, and the person was not there, and he didn't take his drug. So I was busy trying to say, what's the problem? The hospital and all of that. I wasn't even thinking the hospital, hospital, but because he talked about money, I'm like, okay, how much? Let me just. Yeah. So a lady there, and I said, no, don't do money. There's the general hospital is just here. Let's take him there since you're ready to to help. So I I, I offered and and then they put him in the car. I go to the, the general hospital. Okay, you say you go to general hospital and all of that. I went straight to the emergency. I'm like, please, please, this is emergency. Help me, Anna. Um. I want to register the man and all of that. He said no, that he has his name. I will, the, the register was going, the nurse was like, okay, what's your name? So if you say, I, let me just assume, he said Adamu uh, something, right? And the lady will go all the way, there's plenty of Adamu's and all of that. He said, okay, what's your address? So we kept going, I said, just leave the names, let's register a new one and all of that. So he now said to me that his hospital is General Hospital Lube that I should take him there. I'm like, <laughs> and my daughter is still on her uniform. He needed the money. Yes. Yeah, he didn't want to go to the hospital. He just needed the money. Yeah, so when that was happening, the nurse now signaled me and I said, Madam, you can, you see, you, you have to leave. Just about when I was leaving, you know, I just said, okay, if you want to register, I left the money with the nurse and just about when I was leaving. You know, people didn't know how the story, how it started and all of that. In front of this Asokoro uh, hospital and all of that, I was just about to come out. The guys came out and started screaming, you can't leave me like that. I'm a human being. I'm a human being. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. Yes. Yeah, so, so with that experience, people like people like that will make because I went back to him. People had gathered and all of that. You look at him like it's probably my worker or something that I'm leaving the way I'm leaving and all of that. So I came back to him. I said, "Please, what's my name?" Mm -hmm. Because everybody have gathered. I say, "What's my name?" He didn't know. I'm like, "You see what you're doing. What you're doing, I will make other people. But you can't stop people like me." Yeah. You know. So. I mean, with that kind of uh, the thing, there's always fear and all of that. And it's true that we should also be careful because there are people that, from any good, there are bad that comes out of it as yes, well. Yes. People can run with this message and then people would want to take it thinking that they are the right people and all of that. And then fall victims and all. Oh, that's quite an experience, you know. I, you know, it's scary at times when you meet somebody that wants to, you know, cheat you without thinking of the repercussions, you know, on you. Thank you so much. Let's bring in Reverend John Joseph. Reverend John, I am a woman, and uh, in most crisis situations, the most concern is about women and children. I'm sure Stephanie will have to come into that. But um, uh, you're, you're part of a religious body that ensures that um, women do not suffer from crisis situation. Now, what is the role that should be given to women in, in, in situations like that to participate in the peace building itself? Because women are naturally nurturers of people. Uh, thank you very much for bringing this important aspect of what we have lost in our effort to build peace for a long time. I think our refusing or our rejection of involving and engaging women in most of our peace dialogue, in most of our peace meeting, have actually cost us so much. Not many people understand that the woman plays a very vital role in every life and in every peace effort. After all, the child or the young man out there that is going out with dagger came from a woman and he listens to his mother. The man or the woman also is a wife to the man who is also going out there to fight. So most times, women are not just victims, but really women are a key player in finding solution that we've not really talked about. Because all the time we say they're victim, victims, without knowing that, look, they are, if we had involved them long enough, earlier enough, 
in the foundation of the conversation, in helping the young men to have better understanding of peace, in helping the men or the husbands or their brothers, because they, they belong to any of this group, in helping them to know what to do to ensure there's peace in the environment. Uh, the women will not become victims, but because we have neglected them, we only fight and kill, then the woman becomes a widow or she becomes a mother who has lost her children. So women plays a very good role. Women have many, many, many roles to play in helping bringing about peace. Uh, in the conversation, in the actions, women should be there. But let me also say a little about the victim role. It is sad that most of our wives, most of our mothers, most of our sisters have become victims of the terrible crisis that is going on in the community because their husbands are killed, their children are killed, their families or their home is burned. Uh, they go out there, they have no food. Uh, that's why they cry for their husband, they cry for their children, they cry for the home. And so people think that the best women can do is crying. I want to encourage us to know that we have not gain what we're supposed to gain long ago because we didn't bring women to the table. There's a kind of conversation a mother will bring when she's on the table of dialogue that a man may not think about. There's a kind of angle that a woman will see and suggest in every dialogue, in every conflict situation that you want it to resolve that men will not do. In our little effort in local communities, we've realized that the first among the gatekeepers we look for, apart from the traditional rulers and faith leaders, are the women. If you succeed in getting their buy-in for the process, you will get the young men understand. You will get their husbands understand. You will get their, their brothers understand. So women have a key role. Uh, instead of looking at them every day as a victim, I'm trying to see what, 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 how, do people, how people should recognize their role, their contribution, what they can do to sustain peace. Women go to the market and live together in the market. There's no Muslim woman or Christian woman, Hausa woman or a tribal woman. They just see themselves as women. And uh, when you look at how women take in and give birth, there is no labor that is Muslim or Christian or Hausa or Fulani or Ham. Labor is labor. So women feel the pains of childbirth. And no woman will want her son to be killed. Or no woman will want her husband, whom she looks up to with respect, to be killed. So women have this key role to play in helping resolving conflict, even though they are victims. But let's look at that positive role so that when we use it, the victim angle we look at them will cease to be. Because when they begin to play their role, helping to douse tension, helping to train their children to know what it means to love the other person's child, helping to draw the attention of their husbands to understand the danger of going to, to war, helping to remind their brothers that, look, it is not right for you to cause another person pain because if you cause other people's pain, and I'm also cause pain, you see the pain is for all of us. Uh, so why don't we engage women in that conversation and bringing them out? Most of our traditional settings is that when you go to talk to people about peace, if you're asking them to invite people, they hardly invite women. It's now that few are beginning to invite women. But I want to encourage our traditional institutions that, look, you can discuss this matter that involves your community without talking to the mother who will give birth to the children that you are saying they are drug addicts. Get her involved. Hear her view. Seek her blessing. Seek her buy-in. And things will work. But on the victim side, uh, most of us go there to only just show them support and, uh, and go away. But I think the women want their voice to be heard more than just the support we give and go away. You know, uh, Reverend, uh, this issue that you've just discussed now came up in one of our conversations on Good Morning Nigeria. And I'm, we're not trying to be particular here. Uh, we're talking about unknown gunmen and they sit at home in the southeast which was uh, often violently enforced and we had guests uh, from the southeast of nigeria and the question then arose so look uh what is the role of of the community itself and one of the guests did say that for instance the first daughter syndrome uh, that's the ada ada syndrome that uh, it's a very powerful uh, uh, network, but that that network had not been deployed for this purpose uh, of saying restrain the so-called unknown gunmen if they are one amongst you. And it hadn't worked, but then you moved up to the northeast of, of the country, and then you also asked yourself the same questions. Where were the mothers 
when the Boko Haram elements started out and then have been wreaking havoc, and then they also create their own cycles of families and so on and so forth. You go to other parts of the country, and the same question also arises. Where are the women? Where are the mothers? Everyone sits back, you're talking about victimhood, and says, oh, no, we bear the brunt of all of this. But in terms of projecting them and saying that, uh, aside from the socialization effort that uh, occurs usually in early life and up to a certain stage, uh, there could be critical elements in peace building efforts. But we appear to have uh, sidelined, neglected, and altogether ignored uh, this otherwise very powerful gender in our quest for peace. Reverend. Reverend. Question. You see, because they have always been seen as victims, they are not seen as people who can contribute to the conversation. Most time, and in many of the cultures, women are afraid to push too hard so that nobody sees them as if they are pushing faster than where they're supposed to be. That's why deliberately, as our boss did say earlier today, we have to create a system where women are involved. When women know that they will be, their voice will be heard, they, there's a role they can play, on their own, they will call each other's, uh, whether it is the Ada, the first daughter thing, they will move out, they will speak to the community, and their voice will be heard. These people who give orders, sit at home, uh, they capitalize on nobody, no voice. Because the other time I was somewhere and they, they asked me this question that, okay, are there no stakeholders in those communities that are not working? Most of the other stakeholders are seen from monetary aspect or political office holders. Well, we have better stakeholders at home who are the women. And nobody have actually allowed them to speak. Something happened some years back before Shekou was killed. I think one of the journalists got to meet his mother and interview her. I, I, I read that interview, and I just could see the pain of that woman, that my son is causing the world pains. My son is causing the world sorrow, or is causing Nigerian pains and causing Nigeria sorrow. That woman expressed regret, condemned the action of her son. It wasn't long he, get, he was killed. But I'm not saying that uh, because you condemn him, he was killed. But what I'm simply saying is that a mother blesses her children. A mother speaks favorably about her children. But when a mother is sad, and disturbed because of the action of our children, it never goes without repercussion. So there is a role women can play, but we need to deliberately create the avenue, give them that enabling environment, and help them see that we want them, not the one that nobody cares about them. We just say, oh, they are victims and leave it there. No, women want to see, and I'm believing that as many that are watching us this morning, as we celebrate this day, know that if we want to do action for peace, one of the action is create, give women a voice involve them in what needs to be done at the local level in the family many family meetings women don't come there they just, some men will just sit down and take decision for the women and think that their voice do not matter it is gonna those days when we do that because communities that involve women progress faster solve their problem faster than those who are leaving women behind and thinking that no they have no role to play than to just take care of children they have bigger roles their words are more powerful and more convincing than you can imagine thank you so much reverend jones joseph for that important you know input into this conversation we'll take a break right now when we return the conversation will continue don't go away Hey, welcome back and this is still good morning nigeria and our guests are still in the studio stephanie i am still going to throw the question i threw at the reverend to you you're a woman we feel our pain you know and now you know how it is let's have your own you know perception on that no i, I like the part where uh, reverend said uh, we need them uh, yeah. the women and all of that yes we need you need us yeah. do you really would you let us be the women that we are? Um, you know that uh, no matter what you do, women are the mediators. And when it comes to peace and all of that, it starts from the home front, um, the family uh, circle, mm -hmm. and how they treat their kids to relate to the society and all of that. And if we begin as a nation and government to do all inclusive for women. I'm sure that um, the women have an angle and the angle for women always is peace. A woman will always do, if the first thing a woman do is to trust. Yeah. 
Yes. And when they trust the love, and they, they run with it. And when the opposite is uh, the result, they, they, they tend to go the other way as well. Um, it's always good to bring our mothers and um, represent who we are as a woman that speak positively into life, into our kids and all of that. You remember what happened uh, in, I think, the war in, in Liberia in, in yes. the 2004? Sierra Leone and Liberia. Yeah, yes, it took uh, the, a woman to bring the two leaders together to, to broke a peace, uh, the civil war, right? And, and that's to tell you the strength of a woman and how they can mediate when it comes to uh, uh, peace talking and all of that. And I like what, um, where we are now that uh, the government that this is trying to do all inclusive as well and uh, try to give the women a chance to to speak and they can only speak if you allow them to get on the table if they are not on the table the decision and uh, be part of the decision makers there is nothing that you would say uh, even even though the the men rule the, the women also control it from home yes. and and if you if they say that's that's uh, we every successful man there's a woman yes there is that woman that's always go back to say um what you said this this other day you know you were supposed to do it this other way you know and because she knows her husband she knows exactly the way to pass the message the other day on the funny side uh the one of our uh member of the parliament w was saying that um he was saying uh, that yeah give women all the power and everything you know I go home my wife uh, tells me what to do but don't give them a lot of power because the way she controls me at home if she start doing it outside that it, it's going to be a problem so you you come that it's for men they just want to they want to be men and, and they want control, to control just the, the control mm -hmm. and I, I tell I tell every woman that I think the only thing that a man needs from a woman is not even love is respect yeah. so wants to feel the sense of that respect they, they run with it and and you know as educated as you are as a woman there is nothing that you would do even in your home front that your brother would not look at you and say hey you're acting like a man you, you have to call this if you need if you want to get married why can't you be a woman why can't you be a woman so a woman for them you're supposed to be soft mm. and all of that and if you walk into a room i have i have my friends the ceos and all of that you know they walk into a room, the first thing they look at the woman, how did you get here? Yes. How come you're a CEO? What level? What got you there? It is never about the intelligence yes, or intelligence. what you know or what you can do, you know. You know, Stephanie, I'm sorry to uh, interject so that we can maximize the remainder of the time. Mm -hmm. When we put gender issues on the table, we can look at it from multiple dimensions. Yes. But here now, our focus, so that we can, as I said, uh, take advantage of the remainder of the minutes we have for this program, is to say, uh, you got it right, how do we, I, I, I hope that's the right word, capacitate, I know that is used in a different mm -hmm. sense, but mm -hmm. capacitate women mm -hmm. uh, in our society to be at the table as mediators. Uh, when conflict breaks or it's about to break. And that's part of the, what you raised earlier, uh, Ochogu, namely that how do we take our society back? And one of the elements that has emerged now is we have diminished the role of women in taking our society back. So how do we capacitate them mm. in that regard? And secondly, part of what you also raised earlier, how do we ensure that government itself is further capacitated to exercise control. Right. Okay, um, I think this is a very interesting dimension to the discussion, and it's great that this is coming on the International Day of Peace. Um, the issue of um, women, one, it is not only local or national, it's a global issue. And I think the United Nations system is very much aware of it. That is why you have what they call United Nations women, specifically put. And there is a United Nations Security Council resolution on human peace and security, you know, that try to deal with some of these issues that we are talking about in terms of bringing women to the 
front line, you know, to the table of um, discussions, mediation, negotiations in the area of um, conflict resolutions and all that at the community level, at the national level. And um, I'm glad to report that um, the Institute for Peace and Conflict Resolution has been working with the Federal Minister of Women Affairs you know, over the years and other stakeholders, you know, to develop what we call the National Action Plan on Human Peace and Security. You know, I think um, we'll be having some of those conversations and see how um, we can scale it down. I had a conversation with Her Excellency, um, the chairperson of the Nigerian Governors Wise Forum, and we had a conversation around that um, human peace and security. How do we take it to the state level and to the local level to ensure that there is a very strong voice of advocacy you know, in this particular direction to help women at the community level, at the local level and at the state level, you know, to play key roles, you know, in the area of peace and conflict resolution and, and security. So that is a program and it's um, glad that there is a national action plan on that already, you know, with all clear drawn out activities and all that that needs to be run with. That tells you that there is an understanding you know, that this is a problem and there is a need to deal with it. And dealing with it, you know, differ from country to country, particularly in a country like ours where the cultural and religious norms, you know, are strongly against women. You know, we need to do more footwork, you know, and, and stronger engagement with the traditional um, institutions and the religious institutions to see how women can play key roles. And, and these things are not new to us. Of course, we've heard of um, Queen Amina of Zaria and her exploits and other women leaders, you know, who have played key roles in this sector. So how do we um, mainstream some of these things and increase the voice, you know, of this um, woman? So it has to take a um, lot of trainings, a lot of capacity building in terms of um, training, advocacies, you know, and general sensitizations and awareness. And to also understand, too, that education actually makes a wall of difference yes. in the sense that a child who is educated and a child who is not educated, you know, their perspectives of life, you know, differs. How the child who is educated would treat a girl that was in the same class with him and maybe even beat him in terms of coming first or second ahead of him will differ from a child who never went to school. And that is why we need to take our educational system very, very serious. Of course, also, we know that government have provided um, basic education very free, you know, from primary school to GSS-3. So how do we ensure that our children, you know, across the country, you know, participate in this process of education? It is sad, you know, to note that we have a very high number of out of school children, but how do we begin to get back these children to school? What are the programs and agenda we need to draw to get these children back to school and ensure that every Nigerian citizen, as long as you're a citizen, you go through that basic school. Because as you are going through that basic school, you are facing, you are going through a process of um, socialization and orientation, you know, with an understanding of what citizenship is all about. But when you have a, a large number of people who don't go through this system, and maybe they go through a different system, either a religious system or whatever criminal system and all that, then we're going to have a big problem. And I'm saying this because if you look at um, the, they call them bola boys. Huh. You know, that's one of the strongest menace you find in this country today. You know, those are boys that move in the nooks and cranny of everywhere, except you barricade your estate and then they cannot come in. Otherwise, they go about as if they are carrying metals or carrying waste bin and all that. Any little thing they can carry. And sad to know too, they're in all villages right now, as we yeah. speak. So what kind of metals are you looking at in the rural areas of Nigeria? So, so those are some of the things we need to do. If we get our citizens... Pro uh, private property. Yes. Right? Some of them yeah. are removing like fence lamps. Yeah. I've seen some videos yes. on no, social media. If, even national assets. Absolutely. For yes. example, all the real system that before we were born, we were laid. Majority of those real systems, particularly yes. from the Benue, Abakaleki area, and going up not to Kafanche, so they've they all been removed. Have, the metals yeah, have been removed. Yeah, yeah. So, so we need this level of um, been socialization. they shipped to some Asian countries. countries. That's the truth. So we need, and, and these are very serious matters that um, from conversation we need actions. You know, actions with other stakeholders and all that. So I, I think capacitation, that is what we need, you know, for we have, we need this whole of society, you know, whole of government approach, you know, on how we are able to not only deal with the issue of women, but deal with the wider issues of um, peace, you know, in our society. And to also mention that 
at the Institute for Peace and Conflict Resolution, we are partnering with several other organizations like the African Youth Growth Foundation, the Brand Life Foundation, and some other groups, you know, and the Soccer International to, to actually <coughs> amplify the voice, you know, for peace actions mm. in Nigeria, you know, and in the world to ensure that um, the global, the sustainable development goals are met because without peace, the sustainable development goal will still remain a very far cry, even when we get to 2030. Yes. So peace is central. Okay, thank you so much. L l let's bring in Reverend John Joseph again into the conversation. We've talked about women, but the youths constitute a larger population, a larger portion of our population here in Nigeria today, and most of them are the ones involved in what we are discussing today. Have we been able to bring the youths on the table to discuss with them issues that concerns them and why they go about doing all this? Uh, I can say without fear of contradiction that a lot of Nigerian youth are actively involved in one way or the other in finding solution to Nigerian problem. The truth is that we have so many group youth organizations in many states, in local communities. I met some of them here in the plateau and we had fantastic conversation, I can see the commitment, the enthusiasm, the dedication, the, will, the desire, the ambition to make their community a peaceful community. But having said that, you have to understand that in this conversation we've been talking a lot about where certain things are absent, the chances is that evil will have its way. So if these youth are enthusiastic and want to do something, but they've been to school and there's no job. Those who want to go to school, they can pay their school fees. In the past four weeks, you know, the challenge we've been facing all over Nigeria is a uh, hike in school fees in many places, including even in Plateau. I remember youth came out in large number in the University, in university of Just to protest against the hike in school fees. Uh, same, same thing in Lagos and other institutions. So coming that we have no job, we have no food, we are poor, no money, and there is hike in school fees, that is why I said when government gives a vacuum, the shadows come in. So I commend those youths who are actively involved and doing their best to find peace. But I want government to understand that the youth constitute a larger population of Nigeria. So not all of them have been won or have actually been uh, win to start this effort. The other one, then you win them by education, win them by providing job, win them by providing services that will attract them. But once there's no job, they even laugh at those who are in school who are speaking peace. Which peace are you telling us? After all, I've been out of school for 10 years, there's no job. If there's any vacancy or any uh, recruitment exercise, recruitments are not done on merit. People don't apply to be employed. People only get there because they were nominated by a senator or a commissioner or a governor or somebody in the presidency. Because when you hear the way and manner they nominate themselves, it's quite a shame. Can't we have a system where if there's a recruitment for immigration, recruitment for custom, or serving in the NDA, you don't need anybody. You just need to come out and showcase that you can deliver. Let me put this and attach with what we are discussing. The reason why we don't have peace in Nigeria, another reason is because most of those who are engaged as policemen or recruited as police or in the security of Nigeria, a good number of them only went there because they were looking, they were just looking for a source of livelihood. They're just looking for a job. They didn't go there with the passion, with the desire to protect and defend Nigeria. Have you observed that the moment they graduate or the moment they pass out and they are posted, the next thing is that they are scrambling to be orderly of one uh, VIP or to be uh, to attach to one minister or one governor or one uh, big man. They are not thinking about Nigeria. So when you look at this, because security has several rules, the role of people who are dialoguing to bring about peace and the role of those who are working as their constitutional mandate to ensure that criminals don't come and cheat people and go away. Yes, Reverend John, we've actually run out of time and um, Nigerian youths are, you know, moving forward and they're, you know, making waves across the world and back here. But they also need much encouragement. And before we leave, before we sign off our guest here this morning, this has been how it's been on Good Morning Nigeria today. Let's thank our guest, Dr. Reverend John Joseph Hayab, Country Director, Global Peace Foundation, Nigeria. Thank you so much for coming on Good Morning Nigeria. Stephanie Nadi, Nigerian entrepreneur and CEO, 1% International Management Services.
thank you for your insight and contribution to the conversation. Dr. Joseph Ochogu, Director General, Institute for Peace and Conflict Resolution. Thank you for coming on Good Morning Nigeria. And before we go, we will we, we wish our First Lady a happy birthday. She's, she's 63 today and um, we read through what the, what the husband wrote about her, you know. We know our president is somebody that, you know, is concerned about women empowerment. We can see from his appointment and he said a lot of good things about his wife, appreciating her presence in his life and contribution to what he has become today. It's quite lovely actually Chrisley. absolutely absolutely so so congratulations to us it's 63 and many happy returns as the saying goes i thought we were going to get a cake anyway this morning <laughs> <laughs> no, the, cake, the cake would be, I'm not sure where she is exactly now, but the she's cake She's in Nunga. Uh, yes, she's, she's, she's in New York. There, there, will be, yes. there, there, will, there will be uh, a proxy cake at the villa. Yeah, I'm sure uh, we're going to see something today in the news about her birthday celebration there. That's right. It will be lovely. All right, so that's it for us on Good Morning Nigeria today. We appreciate your being with us. Tomorrow is another day, same time, 7 o'clock in the morning. Until then, look after yourselves. I'm uh, Kingsley Osadolo. And I'm Jumwe Yusuf. You have a great day. Bye.